So the funniest thing is the picture kind of went viral in the company that he works for mm-hmm. because it's on Vogue, like the cover of Vogue. <laughs> and it's my dad just Fuck yeah. fully looking Flexing. Like, like a supermodel. And no, it's amazing because initially they're like, all the people are trying to make fun of him, but he looks so good and it's on Vogue that they're like, wait, are you a top <laughs> model? And it was so funny at the end, he was like, yeah, it's like, where's my agent? What's yeah. next? What's up, everyone? I'm Zach, and welcome to the Augzoro podcast, which is inspired by, but not limited to, the curiosity of myself. Whether I speak with doctors, designers, athletes, or music artists, the goal is to improve my own way of thinking and hopefully help others think better themselves. Thank you for joining me on this journey. If you'd like to keep up with all things Augzoro, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and subscribe to our twice monthly newsletter. In this action packed email, We send you the latest Augzoro content, as well as articles, podcasts, books, shows, and other content we find exciting and useful. Go to Augzoro.com or visit the link in the podcast description to join over a thousand others who get the newsletter. Also, you can now support Augzoro on Patreon for two, five, or $10 per month. On Patreon, you get early access to all podcast episodes, discounts on merch, and one Patreon-exclusive episode each month. We're an independent platform with no outside investors, and we rely on listeners like you to keep the conversation going. Go to patreon.com forward slash Augzoro to become a patron, and thank you for your support. This time, I sit down with Colm Delane, the founder of the creative collective Kid Super. Colm truly thinks unlike anyone else I've had on the podcast, and I'm beyond grateful that he stopped by the Augzoro studio, which isn't too far from Kid Super's home base in Brooklyn. In this episode, Colm discusses the early days of Kid Super, the inspiration behind his most recent collection, Bowl in a China Shop, having his parents walk in his very own fashion show, getting kicked out of his NYU dorm, the come up with Russ, and more. Without further ado, please enjoy this deep dive with Colm Delane. place to start would be humans and paintings because when I when I was preparing the the tea for this podcast I heard you say to Manoa that you like paintings of humans more than objects what about paintings with humans strikes you in a a more meaningful way than other types of paintings yeah that's funny I was watching an old video of me as a child and I was holding the camera and I kept focusing on the scenery rather than the people, Mm -hmm. you know, I was, cause I was holding the camera. I didn't care about capturing my mom or my dad or me or my friends. And I realized that it told no story. You know what I mean? I was more curious about the story of the people than the surroundings. And I always think I traveled and uh, moved a lot growing up. And I think all experiences and places are dependent on the people that you're with. I don't know if that is the translation of why I like painting people in paintings, but I do think the best connection we have is from people to people. It's most interesting and there's more stories to tell. And yeah, I was never, I was never so while traveling or moving, I was never the place. It was always the people. In terms of the visual aspect, I think there's definitely some type of connection with the human face. Because even even when we're first born as just these tiny little baby life form things, the one of the things we can recognize is other human faces. Like you always see a baby, it's kind of like heads bobbing around and then it'll lock onto a human face. And like, we just have that instinct from right when we pop out of the womb, like this is a person and this is a cabinet, but like how, like how would you know that you have, you have no context of what's, what's happening, but it's, it's pretty wild how early we can lock onto those meanings. Yeah. Detect 
the human spirit. There's definitely something <laughs> about our connection as the species we are. But yeah, I think even like old time painting, it's very cool to see the emotion that you can get in a painting of someone's face and the story that that tells. And when I'm doing painting, I like to put kind of different people in different scen- scenarios, like working together. Mm. When when you're painting a scenario, how do you start? Because as, as someone like me that never paints shit and you have a concept of what a good painting looks like, starting the process can be so intimidating because in my mind, I'm like, well, there's thousands of directions that you can go in. I mean, even... I guess in other creative avenues too, like a podcast, you can literally take the conversation wherever you want, but a painting, it's right in front of you. So you can see the strokes and everything and and what the artist is doing and it all comes together as the final product. And so you don't really see how they started when when you're, before you think about what you're actually going to put on the paper, how do you kind of start it in your mind and those first few strokes when you're actually starting to get going? So the cool thing I mean, about paintings, there's so many layers. You can start with a sketch or sometimes I start with a sketch on paper where I know exactly what I want to do or some, and sometimes you just go at it and kind of figure it out. And that's kind of a beautiful thing too, because you can step back and see and you get inspired by your work, which is kind of cool. It's, you're telling a story that you're figuring out as well. So sometimes I'll do... I'll do a painting and step back and be like, wow, I didn't see that. Yeah, like who the fuck painted yeah, that? Exactly. It's like, <laughs> that's man. Sick. So that's, that's a cool experience as well. But, um, yeah, I even have sometimes if I, a lot of the things I do are so last minute. So I'll have like a gallery show that I'll set for two weeks from now. And then the night before I'll have to like continue editing but a lot of the times I'll have people like my friends or anyone that's over and I say just go at it go at Mm -hmm. the canvas and they'll set a a background that's random and unique and different and that can inspire me as well so that's a a little secret (laughs) so so you feel like the the layers of inspiration almost feed off of each other like the the inspiration as the painting is progressing, you start to feel more and more inspired as you're going along or more, more and more energy, like yeah, creative I energy. Like the, I like the layers. So it tells it there's, there's kind of a depth to it. There's a story to be told by how many layers were applied, but I actually did one art show where I was running out of canvases and canvases are kind of hard to stretch. Mm. They're hard, time consuming and expensive. So I reached out to or my friend and I was like, hey, man, do you have any canvases? Because he works for uh, this artist. He's like, yeah, th- this artist just threw away a ton of canvases. Like, if you want them, I can bring them by for some kids super close. I was like, fine, we'll do the trade. And when he brought them, I thought they were going to be blank, but they were mm-hmm. completely filled. And they weren't done paintings, but they had tons of work on them. Mm-hmm. And it was funny. So I did a whole gallery show where parts of it of the paintings were that guy's like leftover work so it was a little bit of a collaboration and I don't know did that guy that threw them out know that you his leftover work was appearing no had no idea which is kind of funny because I don't know him so but some of the parts where I was like man this is beautifully done and so I it was like I would say a collaborative effort (laughs) so do do you think of do you think of painting differently when it's going to stay on a canvas and it's not going to become a part of a t-shirt or another item of clothing? Or to you, is it all just design and the medium is secondary? You're not really thinking about it. A little bit of both. I think for me, how I approach things is all the same kind of mentality in terms of creating a painting or a t-shirt or a film or whatever. But I do think some a great painting might not translate as a great t-shirt design. Mm-hmm. And I think you see that a lot of the times with these top designers or these top artists when they try to make merch or t-shirts, it's never good. Louis Vuitton and all of them kind of struggle to make the simple basic t-shirts. 
And yeah, designing a t-shirt. Do you think they're like overthinking it or, or what do you think usually goes wrong I there? think it's just practice. They're spending most of their time making all of these high-end cut and sew clothing that they didn't, they weren't in high school like I was designing t-shirts. I was, I wasn't think they can d- make dresses way better than me because I wasn't making dresses, but designing a t-shirt isn't as easy as people think. It's also such a blank canvas to do. It has restraints. So it's like a painting. A lot of it is like spatial ability to, it's a funny. Yo, know, I'm, th- I'm thinking about it right now. And just a- as someone who has seen so many t-shirts worn so much different shit. I've never actually really designed any clothes besides just some simple logo stuff. But if I see a painting or a drawing and someone says, oh, do you like that drawing? Maybe I would say, yeah. But then if someone asked me, oh, would you wear that? Then I would have to think again. Like it wouldn't be the same response. I would have to say, okay, do I like this drawing? And then, okay, like, would I wear that on a t-shirt? It's too, like, I'd be pulling from two different desires almost, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. I mean, an all over print. I mean, it's funny that I'm wearing one, but an all over print hoodie with the painting isn't for everyone and doesn't always work. But I do think there's a, I was funny. I did a, uh, a trend forecasting talk once and I was, Back in the day, and the whole industry is changing now, but probably like 20 years ago, all of these major companies would buy these books of trend forecasting from these trend Mm -hmm. forecasting companies. And they'd be like $20,000 books. And they would predict what is going to be popular in the next two years or whatever. What color, what fabric, what trend, blah, 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 blah. And I was talking to the lady and I was like, "Uh, which, what is the number one determining factor for you? Where are you getting all of this that information from or to, to try to guess what color is going to be popular in the years to come? And she said, the art world. And I thought that was pretty interesting since in our day-to-day, it doesn't feel like the art world is really dictating my mm. decision-making. So that was an interesting concept. So she was researching the art world and everything and how that affects the fashion world and then how that affects down to the T-shirts you buy at TJ Maxx. Does she mean more like gallery art? Like Yeah, yeah. She was talking about paintings and the contemporary art world. So I guess... She wouldn't really take into account what people were wearing on the street or just things she was noticing right. in everyday life. That's what I would assume. Yeah. But no, she was saying, it, I mean, now everything's changing. So. Yeah. You would, you would think if you're, if your job, if someone gave me the job of saying, all right, you have six months to create some sort of forecast for the next five years of fashion, I would definitely look into the art world somewhat because maybe there is some downstream from that world into the the fashion world, I'm sure, because there's a lot of overlap with designers. But then I would think most of my job would just be going out every day in different environments, watching what people wear, looking at certain trends, you know, talking to people, asking them like, yo, why'd you buy that as opposed to this? Or, Or what do you think of this color? What do you think of that? And like, just like the more guerrilla warfare shit on the ground. Right. I think she was saying that it's more, it's big pic, it's more big picture. It's like those people are getting inspired from actually people that are getting inspired mm. from people that are getting inspired from the art world. I don't know. I saw, it's interesting. I, I saw you had a recent Instagram post where you said you were creating an archive of products and, and designs. And I was wondering for you, if we take the t-shirt, what do you think are some of the components that make up a great t-shirt for you that maybe some of the other designs where you, you just see it and, and something's not meshing for whatever reason, th- things are elements that they're lacking for you. What makes up a great tee? It's hard. That I mean, I think t-shirt designing might be one of the hardest things to design, but um, I like, I mean, there's also things with t-shirts where it just becomes if it becomes iconic, you know what I mean? A lot of it has to do with repetition. It's like you have a logo, it might be okay. But if you hit the logo a million times, it starts resonating on a bigger picture. So when you look at 
the McDonald's arcs, you know, you don't think that's, wow, that's iconic when you first draw it. Mm -hmm. But now when you see a little M on a t-shirt, it means so much more. So there's aspects of that when you're designing where it's like, how am I going to make something that's going to become iconic? Hey guys, I wanted to interrupt this episode real quick to let you know that Auxoro also produces a short form podcast called The Ox. The Ox brings you a daily dose of uncensored wisdom to jumpstart your life. 10 minutes or less, no bullshit, no topic off limits. You can subscribe to the show by searching The Aux, A-U-X, wherever you listen to podcasts. For all the latest Auxoro content, you can follow us on Instagram at at Auxoro, Twitter at at Auxoro Mag, and hit us up for our twice monthly newsletter with the link in the podcast description. Now, back to the episode. And a lot of that is just, how many times am I going to repeat it? And then for... So there's that aspect of t-shirt design where it's making something that resonates as that can be repeated and can become more meaningful than just a sketch. And then there's the yeah placement of designs and drawing. And if you're good at drawing, I mean, a lot of brands use archival imagery. So graphics from vintage posters, graphic from, and that's a whole industry of designing t-shirts that look amazing. So yeah, I have a bunch of friends that spend hours on like archive.net and that's where they get all their inspiration. And all these companies, they'll they'll post their old archives and and stuff like that. It's more like some person in Oregon scanned an encyclopedia from 1932 that has incredible graphics when they're describing like the space launch. Mm-hmm. And then you ri- you cut out the spaceship or you cut out the A in spaceship and that becomes your A. And and that's all for public use. You can go in and, and make that I mean, the party all, design. It's all debatable. <laughs> I don't know if... If no, if, if no if one says legal. anything, then I'm sure... But yeah, I, that's not really my style. I like... I was always, how do I differentiate myself from all of these brands? And so my thing always was, I draw it first and then it's automatically original. So for me, it was always about hand drawing hand producing things so that at the end of the day, at least it's a unique piece of art and you can't do it. That was yeah. huge. It's like, how do you stand out in the crowd? Um, of a million people. Now everyone has the same um, inspiration. Everyone's on the same internet sites, Tumblr sites, looking at the same stuff. So how do you kind of differentiate yourself? Yeah. I saw a tweet the other day that said, be original to eliminate your competition. And I think there's a lot of truth in that because there's only, there's only one you and that sounds cheesy as shit but if you if you take it in more of like a consciousness development sort of way like when we were talking about hearing your voice as your uh your consciousness before there's only one you at the moment and so everything you learn everything you incorporate everything you design record a podcast write a book whatever it is you're getting better and better and learning about a different part of your craft every time you do it So like the you from two weeks ago isn't even the you now. And then the you two weeks from now isn't the you that's sitting right in front of me. So it's like you're just one original stream of development. And so if you're constantly pulling from other people, then you're not like, what would your original stream of development, what could that have been if you had only believed in what you were thinking and creating? Well, that's why the Kid Super brand is so based around me and how I'm so public about it being my designs and stuff was my way to make it original. So it was always whatever's not original, right? It goes through the prism, whatever that I am and comes out original. So I always talk about the Pink Floyd album art, Dark Side of the Moon, Mm -hmm. where it's that prism and white light goes in and it comes out colorful. And that was kind of how I wanted to be as a creative. So I could take in tons of information and different mediums and it would come out the kid's super spirit. So 
in terms of originality, that's why the brand was so based on me because at least at the end of the day, I knew I was unique. I knew I had a pers- unique perspective to tell. So it could never be co- considered overplayed or copied because it was coming out of at least my hand or my mind or my art. It's two different mediums, but I struggled a lot with originality when I first started podcasting because I was trying to dissect my favorite podcasters so much to the point where I was almost like I would find myself just asking questions that they would ask and not what I wanted to ask or maybe thinking during a podcast, oh, would Tim Ferriss say this or would Joe Rogan say this? Or like, what would they do in this situation? So it's like this balance in the beginning when you're first starting out with any sort of art, you're taking in inspirations from other people, but you're not taking it too far to the point where you're just becoming a copy of what you're taking in. You're trying to like, like you said, like prism it out with your own thoughts and and emotions and feelings and, and work. So at the beginning, it definitely took me a while before I felt like I was more myself and taking an inspiration and then like prisming it into the podcast rather than just copying it. You need some hot wings. Really make this yes. an original podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Dude, I, I I love that podcast just because it uh, gives you something else to do besides focus on the conversation. And a lot of people have these insane reactions to the hot wings and they all re- react differently. Like when Terry Crews was literally going blind or, or crying or some people are just like, yeah, this is this is not hot at all. But I I I, I like that concept. I think it, I think it's pretty cool, it's and amazing. it's doing well. It's doing it's well. Probably um, the best one. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, as long as we're on the concept of original sketches, when you mentioned the forecasting before, like someone asked you to forecast the the next year's fashion or whatever it was, to have your own YouTube series where you're like a weatherman, but you're forecasting the next six months of whatever's going to come down the pipeline where there's a green screen in front of you. And you're just like, well, like this is the, what's going to be the outlook in the fashion industry, two years, three years, whatever, five years down the line. You're just like doing it like a cheesy weatherman video thing. Not a bad idea. We're going to start releasing a bunch of, uh, YouTube content. I don't know if you've seen all the skits and sketches Mm -hmm. I do, but now I'm going to take it to the more consistent and next level, I think. Hopefully. That'd be dope. Yeah. Get a, we pitched a bunch of TV shows to a bunch of networks and they all were interested, but they were like more concerned with how many YouTube followers we had and how many social media followers we had and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we got to boom those up. Yeah. Well, it's like they want to see the following first before they care about the creation. But then if you have X number of followers, it's like, why do you need the network? Why couldn't you just put it out on your own YouTube channel? So it's like, Chicken what do you want egg. from me? Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, I agree. Um, that's what I was saying. I was like, fuck it. Give me, put, be the platform. But I mean, now it's all about how do you get people to on your network and how do you fight against, you know? But we'll see. It was interesting. It was a fun pitch. I'm going to come back in, you know, in a couple months and pitch it again. <laughs> Keep pitching. Oh, I'm Someone, the, someone's going to pick it up. That's what I was saying. So for people that are not familiar with the kids super space in Brooklyn, can you describe to people how that space came together and sort of walk me through what it looks like and, and kind of the vibe? Because there's so much shit going on and I, I've seen so many videos and, and I want to go visit because it's fucking dope and, and, and it's right here. But for people who have never seen it, can you describe the Kid Super spot in Brooklyn? So when I was a sophomore in college, um, my dorm, I had spray painted my dorm room and it was a store and you'd come into my dorm room and you could buy all Kid Super stuff. So I had racks of clothing, et cetera, et cetera. This is NYU, right? It was at NYU. And so I was in the city and yeah, my dean of housing found out about it and they like threatened to kick me out if I don't take it down. And then I didn't take it down. And then I had this whole meeting, blah, 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 blah. Did they actually kick you out? They like threatened if I didn't take it out to kick me out. And then I was like, I'm, and then I 
dressed up in a suit and made a PowerPoint about why I was this your first weatherman presentation for I was like (laughs) why I should be the face of NYU housing and NYU and this is why NYU wasn't Harvard and this is why (laughs) Mark Zuckerberg didn't go to NYU and I had this whole fucking presentation and then they're like just they didn't like that I was getting mail, like, cause I was sending a shit ton of mail out of my dorm mm-hmm. and some would get received back because, you know, that just happens. What did they say to the presentation when you said that this is why they're not Harvard? What the fuck are you talking about? Cause the dean of housing is completely unrelated to the, like the person who makes the decisions about mm-hmm. NYU. But, and there's 30,000 kids, so they didn't really care. So then I spent all um, the summer from, sophomore year to junior year, trying to find a space that I could live out of like I was doing before. And I randomly stumbled upon this place on Craigslist that had a bathtub. And I called the guy and I'd called probably 10 other people to say, Hey, I want your space, a different mm-hmm. space. And all of them said no to me for different reasons. One was like, I don't want the amount of people you're going to bring here Two is like, you don't have enough money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But this place had a bathtub and I called and I was like, I'm in. I have no idea where this is, but it's got a bathtub. I know I can live there. Yeah, that's Um, all you need. And Just hygiene. So it ended up being next door to Mishka, which was a streetwear brand in Brooklyn that actually no longer is there, but it was super popping back in the day. And then it was just the perfect space. It had this big basement. It had two rooms. It had a store and a bathtub and a kitchen. And I moved in there with an ex-girlfriend and we lived there for a year and I made, and I remember working the store. I'd go to school like Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. And then... Mm -hmm. So you're running the store while you're in school. While I'm in school and I'd come back Thursday, Wednesday, whatever. And I'd have the store open, Mm -hmm. but I was also playing soccer. And so I would come, the hours were weird, but I would be sitting there and nobody would come to the store. I had probably 2,000, 3,000 Instagram followers. It's not in this narrow neighborhood with foot traffic. And I was like, man, I just did all this work. I had this crazy launch party and nobody is coming here. And I'm just a retail worker. I was like, this is horrible. I was like, but I invented this. This is Kid Super. I can do anything. Mm-hmm. So I spent the next like three months probably building out the whole space. So I built a recording studio in the basement. I turfed the backyard. I built like photo studio. I got a sewing machine and everything. So the space now became a space where other creatives could come and work out of. And that was at, at the end of the day, that was kind of the goal of the whole space. The best thing about Kid Super is the people that, that it's introduced me to. I always say that. Mm-hmm. And the opportunities that, that have come and now the opportunities that I, I always say this, like, you always have someone the other day asked me if I'm satisfied with my success. And I don't even view myself as anywhere near where I want to be. But the thing is, you don't get satisfied with your success because Mm -hmm. as you get more and more successful, more and more doors and opportunities open up. So your definition of success and your definition of your goals and your definition of possibilities are always changing. And that's the great thing about this Kid Super thing is it's opened so many doors. So four years ago, I wasn't thinking about getting a Puma soccer field in my store. Now, last week, I just pitched it to Puma and they approved of it. So now, okay, that goal is out of the window. What's You're opening a a Puma soccer field where the the turf is. You're turning that into a Puma soccer field. No, I have to get a bigger space. So you're going to have, this is going to be the second Kid Super official space it'll probably be i'll probably get rid of the one i have now and just move the whole thing into a big that's fucking wild so that's the next goal and we might actually move it to la first as just a crazy jump we're still brainstorming because new york is so expensive for space that's big i mean la is not cheap either but at least you can go on the outskirts and get legitimately 10,000 square foot spaces. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was saying. The, your dreams and goals and everything changes and doors open up. So that's been the best. Being able to think bigger 
is really the beautiful part about this whole journey. And now, since I've done so many different things, met different people, seen so many things, now I'm thinking bigger. And that's, it's kind of, it's beautiful. And you see, you talk to certain people that don't think big because they don't have the doors open up. So there is mm-hmm. a ceiling of dreaming. But I worked, I mean, kind of funny to say, but I worked for Kanye for two weeks. And that was the one thing that I, the major thing I took away besides his crazy ambition, but it was just, he was saying the craziest things. And you sit back and you're like, what are you talking? Like, there's no way that's possible. And then you pause and you're like, wait, he is Kanye West. He could do that. And it was just so cool to see someone that was thinking limitless, completely limitless. Anything was possible. And then you and me are thinking, or we're thinking about what are we doing tomorrow? And you're not thinking, oh, maybe I'll call Elon Musk and I'll pitch him a spaceship. Maybe I'll try to redesign Chicago's building infrastructure. That's not even remotely in our head because it doesn't feel or de- feel possible. Kanye has no limits. So that was really cool. And so that was inspiring for me to think bigger, but also to realize that the more and more these opportunities come, the bigger I can think and the more things I can do. So, yeah. What was the project you were working on with Kanye when he was talking about thinking bigger? It was just, I was there for about two weeks. He had brought me in because he, a friend of mine, Yes Jules, had showed him the dancing clothes. And he was like, why are my clothes not dancing? Bring them here. And that's the cool thing. He just likes being surrounded by creative people. So if he likes anything, he brings them how are, around. How are these clothes dancing? You said it was dancing jewels? No, dancing clothes. Dancing uh, clothes. Stop motion. Okay, so it, like the, the visual aspect of the clothes were dancing and you could like see it. No, like I, I took a... Like one picture, two picture, three picture, oh, four, and, and it looks like they're dancing. Gotcha. It's pretty cool. And then Kanye was like, why the fuck do I not have that going on right now? Exactly. <laughs> I think I, I, would, I would love to be able to be a fly on the wall of the conversation with Kanye or, or be inside his consciousness for 30 seconds. But I imagine that there's so many ideas that he has that don't come to fruition, but he's just constantly trying to churn out ideas or, or refine other ideas. So that was a little bit of the, the, not the disappointing part, but since he's working on so many things, there were ideas that were just falling through the cracks that were great, but it wasn't his focus. Yeah. So then they didn't happen, but he's also, yeah, I mean, he can do whatever he wants. Mm-hmm. Literally. I mean, almost more than any human in a weird way. He talks a little bit about mental health too, but like, it seems like he isn't really afraid to be called crazy because at this point he doesn't really give a fuck. And he he dips his foot in anything. There's a moment he was like, I redesigned sound. I redesigned fashion. Why can't I redesign anything else? And then you're like, and then you're like, fuck, he did redesign sound. Fuck, he did redesign fashion. Like, the way we hear music yeah. is based off him. The way we dress is based off him. Inside your own head, when you have all of these future ideas bouncing around, do you ever find it difficult to focus on what you're doing right now? Like what's, what's in front of you, the, the current project at the moment? Because I know f- for a fact that when I have so, many, so much shit swirling around in my head that I, it, sometimes it's like hard for me to focus on what's actually going on right now. So I have to like remind myself, right? Like this two hours, the other shit doesn't matter. Like this has to happen or else nothing else down the line is going to happen. Do you ever feel like that? I'm not that person. I'm an, uh, my best skill is finishing shit. I never, I don't even think, my thing is I'm not a, I wouldn't say I'm a perfectionist. I'm more of a finisher, a doer. Mm. So for me, the most important thing is to, if you're going to say you're going to do something, it's finishing it. And the great thing is you learn so much about it. And there's always beauty in an end result. 
it's really hard to make something that isn't great. I mean, I just did, <laughs> I did five commercials for Jägermeister and one of them was a bad, uh, I did a bad commercial. It didn't get approved. Two of them didn't get approved, but I was like, man, that was, there's a few times where I make something where I'm like, this is bad. And that was one of them, but it was a learning experience. And it's like, if you're not going to take the leap and try something and finish it, what are we even doing this for? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Why are you even talking or trying or doing this? I think, yeah, finishing is the most important thing. And you learn so much and you grow. And also everybody loves a journey. I don't want to see your first thing you do be this amazing, incredible, successful thing. Mm. I'm not inspired by that. I'm not moved by that. And I'm not a fan of that because it looks like... Looks you like shit, put, yeah. You know, it looks like you didn't put in the work. I want to see 15 million projects of yours that weren't great. And then that one that was great, I'm 100% behind you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So showing... I think that's the world we live in too now is like being transparent and showing your progression and your failures is the new... Like, is the new successes because you grow a fan base that people can relate to. And then people believe in you as well. It's like, this guy's been shooting the shot a million times. He's 100% going to take the next shot. I'm behind it. Even if the shots were missing, you know what I mean? I think that's, uh, unfortunately after the Kobe passing, but what we listen and gain from him is that, tirelessness and focus and he always says he wasn't the most gifted it wasn't the best but he was the hardest worker and we get behind Kobe because we know he shot the ball a million mm -hmm. times instead of the person who just ended up having a one perfect moment yeah I think showing the progression is also also it, it lays the groundwork for others to follow and that's a huge thing with Kid Super is showing the pathway of how I did it so that there's the next kid in high school who instead of focusing on doing drugs or smoking pot or getting girls is in his mom's bathroom screen printing. Yeah. So, and... Well, I think a lot of people, a lot of people don't really get that because especially with social media and just everything is such a, a finished product nowadays. You, social media gives you the opportunity to show your process, but at the same time, there's a lot of finished products out there. So people almost feel intimidated to start something new. They don't, they don't see the opportunity of, okay, if I start this today, I could be good at it five years from now and then fucking sick at it 10 years from now, start making money off of it in a few years. It's always, I, I start this six months down the line, you know, maybe nothing's happening. And then I see someone else that's designing shit that's way sicker than me. And I have no idea that they've been doing it for 10 years. I just see the finished product. So I, th I think that people get discouraged too easily and they don't embrace the fact that the first thing you do is going to be the worst thing most likely. And to just like have fun and experiment and like use it. I think a lot of times when people hit success early on, it's almost like a curse in a lot of ways because... If you make your first song blows up or your or if your first ever design or first podcast, like whatever it is, if that kind of launches you into the the ethosphere, you have no foundation. Like you haven't built anything. Yeah. I mean, I can't relate to that because it didn't happen to me. So I don't yeah, know. I, I don't think it happens. It <laughs> happens. It's like the point zero 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 one, And even when it does happen, you there's still maybe shit that you didn't see behind the scenes. So yeah. it's like, you never know. Everyone has a story and everyone, anyone doing anything, there's a story behind it. I just think it's also important to be excited about the small things. You know, every part of the Kid Super process for me was always something I loved doing. I didn't start making t-shirts because I thought I was going to be a famous designer. I started because that was an, uh, a lane for me to take to express my art mm -hmm. when I was, or make money off of my art when I was young. And then it slowly snowballed into what it is. But that was, that was the thing I always say. It's like, start now, whatever you want, or 
Nadia, it doesn't even matter what you want. You just have to start something and go full on and it'll open doors. It'll give you answers and people will be inspired by your enthusiasm. And if I today wanted to become a senator, a lawyer, a doctor, I would believe in me more than the average kid because of all the work that I had done in the past. You know that I'm not going to give up. You know that I'm able to create stuff from nothing. So I think there's, it doesn't really matter what field you're going to. It's more about focusing, trying hard, executing and finishing projects and you'll figure out what you want. Now I've been pitching TV shows off of t-shirts. So, I mean, the world is our, the world's, the world, it, people get inspired by, by humans and other people that are focused and hardworking and enthusiastic. And so, I mean, those are the most buzz words, but I think it's very, very true. So yeah. when something I was wondering when I was watching a few of your fashion shows, the running as fast as you can, the bowl in the china shops, the most recent one. And then I also watched the the recycle show. Yeah. In New York City. For you, you have design, you have the clothes ready to go, but when you're putting it on showcase and it's like this moving display, what do you think about when you're trying to create a show rather than just the clothes? Like how how does that sort of come together in your mind? I think the fashion shows are kind of just uh, um, a creativity project flex type of, so it's like, how can I be, how can I create something that resonates? How can you be as creative? It's not so much about showing off the clothes because if you want to see a great picture of clothes, it's going to be the product shots that come out on the website. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when you're doing these fashion shows, it's more about, can you make something that resonates with the crowd or tells a story or blows people away creatively? And so for me, it was always about story, the storytelling ability of the brand. I love that this kid's super ethos is so clear. You know, you don't, you might not like the clothes. You might not be able to wear an all over print or all over embroidered, but you understand this kid's super spirit that you all have, or everyone has a little bit of in them and you can be your own kid super, but it's this when you're younger Mm -hmm. And you're little and people ask you what you want to be. And you're like, I can be an astronaut or I can be a superhero. Anything's possible. And that kind of spirit and uh, freedom and joy, I think, is so evident in everything that I do in this kid super spirit. And when I take it to Paris for this high end fashion show, it's like, how do you mesh the two? And so for Bull in the China Shop, the whole idea about behind that was, um, one, my mom is from Spain and the iconography of the Spanish bull that's used to be an old, uh, tobacco company Mm. is now like on all the plane, like you see it often when you're driving through, uh, Spain and became kind of the logo of Spain and bullfighting and everything. But I love the idea of a bull in it. China shop is kind of something unexpected. Are they going to knock everything down or what's going to happen next? Also looks like somebody is the bull is in some place that they shouldn't be. And that was kind of how I felt when I was going to Paris. It's nobody was expecting me to do Paris. And for me, even it was kind of a joke initially when someone asked me if I was going to do a fashion show. I was like, yeah, I'll probably do it in Paris. And they're like, and they're like, oh, I know somebody who can help with that. And so I was like, oh, let me talk to them. And then all of a sudden I was having conversations about where I was going to have this imaginary fashion show. And then all of a sudden there was a moment when I was like, am I going to do this? And I was like, wait, the brand's Kid Super. I'm Kid Super. Of course I have to do this. And that was the inspiring thought behind it. And that it ended up being a smash hit. So yeah, I love that. As you were saying, the conscious speaking, I love that I have this little Kid Super persona that I have to 
uphold that drives me to be the best I can be and pushes me to do different things. And I love, I created this alter ego that is in my mind, the best that I can be. So I, that's another great thing about Kid Super. And I hope that inspires the people that wear the brand, the people that like the brand to also find their inner Kid Super. I saw you had your parents walk in the the fashion show too. I don't know if, I don't remember if it was the most recent one or it was, uh, was the most recent one or Bowen, Bowen trying to show up. I thought that was really cool because something that I've been thinking about is just, how can I incorporate my parents into what I'm doing in the future? And of course, my mom, as soon as I start started interviewing music artists, you know, two weeks after I started the podcast, which is about a year and a half ago, she's just sending me all these artists like Maroon 5, Justin Bieber, like her wish list of getting these artists on the podcast. And like, you got to get me backstage like one day. And I'm just like, I'm trying, mom, I'm trying. But yeah, when I, when I saw that you had your parents walk in the fashion show, that, that was really fucking cool to me because I, I had always wanted to, I always want, I still want to incorporate my parents into what I'm doing. And so I'm sure that it meant a lot to them and, and to you to see them walking a fashion show and fucking killing it going down the runway. So my parents are hilarious human beings and um, crazy human beings. And the funniest thing is there is a documentary about the whole making of the show, mm-hmm. which I'm going to release. I just haven't edited it perfectly. And this kid who's supposed to edit it keeps fucking it up. So Quinn, hurry the fuck up on this video. <laughs> Shout out Quinn. Shout out Quinn. But there's a moment where it's two hours before the show. And I go up to my dad and I go, you're walking. And he's oh, like, so he had no, he he's, had no like, clue. he's like, ha ha, good one, man. And I was like, no, I want you to walk. He's like, uh, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, you walk. And he was supposed to be at his job and had to like call out of his work. And he goes like, you just can't put it on Instagram. Like I'm supposed to be at work. I was like, dad, they're not going to give a fuck about if you went. Yeah, like, so- sorry, I'm at my son's fashion show in Paris. I had to take the day off. So the funniest <laughs> thing is the picture kind of went viral in the company that he works for mm-hmm. because it's on Vogue, like the cover of Vogue. <laughs> and it's my dad just fuck yeah. fully looking Flexing. Like, like a supermodel. And you know, it's amazing because initially they're like, all the people are trying to make fun of him, but he looks so good and it's on Vogue that they're like, wait, are you a top <laughs> model? And it was so funny at the end, he was like, yeah, it's like, where's my agent? What's yeah. next? What are, he's, and, get, he's getting calls from agents saying like, who's that guy that was on the cover of Vogue? I think, does he have representation? So good. <laughs> and then my mom, the funniest thing. So everyone always says like, wow, your mom, must be so proud and grateful that you brought her on the fashion show. And they like interviewed my mom and my mom was like, grateful. Like he needs to thank me. He needed someone who's going to kill the opening dance. I'm the only one he had. I'm free. It's like, he should have paid me more. It's like, yeah, we killed it for him. And so like, it's such a funny perspective that everyone sees it as like, I'm such a good son. And my mom has seen it like, she's such a good mom, yeah. which is so funny. She's like, fuck that. I was the star. He needed star power. Yeah, and that's why he called me. So a little, uh, little power dynamic in the relationship with the parents yeah, who, who it, holds the most uh, fashion power, exactly. the fashion presence. They definitely are. I mean, they're definitely proud and always been supportive, but they're hilarious. They're each other. They're both have their superstar personalities. That is funny when people think they're going to be uh, very like timid and shy yeah. and they're the complete opposite. Yeah. <laughs> Having your parents in is super cool. And then also, I think it was the the recycle show that Lolo Zwei was in. One, my favorite moment from that was Action Bronson when he was walking out with a huge fucking trench coat and people were carrying it behind him. And I forget what song it was, but it wasn't his, it wasn't his song. It was like, uh, like an opera, uh, just like this huge badass moment where he's just walking down the aisle, like dapping up people with a trench coat. So that, that was sick. I mean, Action Bronson walking my fashion show was definitely a fucking bucket list check. And the best thing about, I'm glad you mentioned the song. So we go to Action Right. And we're like, we're probably going to have you walk out to your own music. He's like, no, 
not my own music. He's like, play La Boheme. And we're like, yeah, La Boheme. We're like, what song is that? He's like, I need to walk out to La Boheme. <laughs> and we're I like, it, an hour before the show, I'm like telling DJ, I'm like, download La Boheme. We need it. And so he kind of creative directed the whole fucking thing. Even the long trench, he came like three weeks before or two weeks before. And I, and we had always been talking and DMing because he does a lot of painting. And he does. I didn't know that. Yeah, he does a lot of painting. And he so, does a lot of art projects. So he's always interested in artists and he always loves he loved my painting. He loved it. And he actually always is asking like... Another oh, collab coming soon. <laughs> definitely a collab. We just got to figure it out. But yeah, he was interested in making stuff. So we'd always talk about that stuff. And for the Paris fashion show, he actually... And this is a great quote, but it's called Bull in a China Shop. And he DM me. He's like, if you ever need... He was like, for the Bull in the China Shop, he was like, if you ever uh, needed an actual bull, I'm there. Because he called himself a bull. Yeah. And if I wanted a bull to walk in, I was like, how do I get this to happen? I was like, I'll fly you to Paris. Like, what do you need? And it just never didn't add up or like wasn't possible. So when we did the New York one in Queens, I hit him up. I was like, man, we want you to walk. And so he comes over and he's like, he, the whole experience with the uh, recycling thing and everyone sewing. And he was, he walks in. He's like, yeah, I'll walk if you make me the longest trench coat ever. And he said it. And we were like, say less. We'll yeah. do that in whatever. So yeah, we spend like we'll like make it happen. This uh, Johnny and a couple of the sewers spent probably like four nights cutting up squares to make this amazing uh, trench coat. And yeah, there's a moment. I don't know if you watched the Vice documentary on it, but um, there's a moment in the. I'm in the front. Yeah, hiding, kind of like navigating everything, but I didn't realize like when he came back. Oh, I was doing the speech. And I didn't... I saw that. Yeah, that so, but there's background footage of him and everyone that was holding, like cheering and celebrating and doing like a huddle. And it was just like, man, that was the kid super moment. You know what I mean? Yeah. And shout out to Action Bronson for being just the best dude ever. But also shout out to everyone. There's just such a good energy. It was so many people working together on one vision and we all came together and it didn't matter about, there was, there was nothing, no one cared about the end result. It was more about working together on this project and giving it your all. And then there's this beautiful end result. So it was pretty cool. I mean, it was every fashion show that like final walk and walking out after I do my speech is fucking is a crazy feeling. Yeah, I can imagine because it's like it's happened at that point. You can't change anything about it. There's this still palpable energy in the room, and so it's like everything you're kind of like taking it in. I would imagine in that moment. Yeah, and we're working. I mean, I don't think any other brand is doing it as half as like. <laughs> unprepared as we are. So we're working mm -hmm. so hard. All my friends are involved and it's a 10 minute show, 10 to 15 minute show. And then after you're just like, <sighs> like the best sigh ever. But, um, yeah, like for the Paris one that we just did, <laughs> I don't know if you saw, but there was paint on their shoes. Yeah. So the, the this running, is the running as fast as you can. Running as fast as yeah. you can. And the paint on the shoes, uh, the uh, venue wouldn't allow paint on the ground. So I had so that's to, why I had the sheet out. So I had to do this plastic sheet. But if you put plastic sheet and wet paint, it literally just creates a slip and slide. So all the models were slipping. And obviously, I, if you watch the footage of it, you don't see slipping because I edited it out. Mm -hmm. But there was one time where someone was doing a dance move and it kind of, I couldn't tell if he slipped at, or if he just fell and worked it into like his move because then he just like kind of did like the slip and slide from NBA Street where he just like tumbled over and played it off. Well, but that was planned for him to yeah. be this dancer that's kind of falling. And uh, that was making, it was kind of with the whole running as fast as you can. And I wanted the shoes, the painting on the shoes to end up all over him to show the marks of, you know, because the reason I did the paint, it was just to show visually that everyone has like a path that everyone comes from. So when you're mm -hmm. running as fast as you can, you're going, you're shooting to the moon, you're 
trying as hard as you can, but there's always this history of where you came from and everything and how much you've gone through. So that was the visual representation of the pain. But so many of them were slipping, which you didn't see, but one kid fell on the ground and you, Damn. Yeah, you have to watch it. I actually cut it for the video. It's at the end. So I say, thank you. Da, 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 and then I put like a little video of him falling, but I was talking to people that watched the show and since everyone was slipping, there was such a tension in the room because you're watching all these models slip. And then at the end, there's a dancer who's slipping on purpose. So this whole thing comes together and you feel there, it was like a palpable tension and you didn't know what was going to happen next. You didn't know it was a pot, well, on purpose. You didn't know if everything was going wrong. And then at the end, it's this beautiful dance and the clothes are gorgeous and there's this video and it just ended up being this whole moment that I didn't really create on purpose, like the slipping I didn't mm -hmm. want on purpose. But I come out and I say, my ending speech was like, look, we all slip and fall in sometimes. And that's kind of the journey. But it's all, and then it's like, yes, obviously it's like, how many times do you get back on the horse? Mm -hmm. The more classic, um, classic saying of all or time. Or back on the bull. Back, right. on, back on the Bronson. Exactly. But yeah, it was so cool to, visually for a 10 minutes kind of show the struggle that it is to get there. You know, all the times that I fucked up, all the times I slipped and it, these models as they slipped around this cube that was showing normal people sprinting and becoming, you know, whatever you want to be. It was just a kind of physical and visual representation of the whole journey. And now, and I love that it was called running as fast as you can because, you know, I'm always trying to get there. I'm always trying to be the best I can be. So, yeah, I mean, just thinking about it, I can like feel that feeling and it's inspiring, but also, you know, emotional because there were so many times when you slip and fall or you don't know what's going to happen next or, you are you know, we only have this one life and you're all planning it and trying to run. But, um, yeah, it doesn't always end up how you want it. So, yeah. It's like a double level of uncomfortability from the audience and the the artist or the performers because usually if you see a piece of uncomfortable art, if you're going to see a play or a musical performance and it leaves you feeling uncomfortable, the the performer knew what was going to happen. Like that was part of their plan. But then you have the audience watching people slip and fall. And then the people that are about to walk out, the models are wondering, oh fuck, like am I going to slip and fall? And so it's like they're both uncomfortable at the same time. And then you're standing there watching like, oh shit, like I wonder what's going to happen in the show. Like it's still yet to be determined. So that kind of, I, I would imagine in person that kind of feeds off of each other. And it's like this really cool sense of art, uncomfortability. And I, I always like art that leaves me a little bit discomforted in, in some way or like was that supposed to happen? like me wondering like was that intentional was that not intentional like I don't know what was happening there but it was cool regardless yeah and I didn't plan so much for the slipping but I remember talking to my dad after because my dad was there um and my mom was there I was gonna have them walk but I thought it would be you can only do it so many times but he was like, man, I was on the edge of my seat because I knew how much work went in. And then it looked like it was messing up. And then this ending show kind of the, with the dance, it releases. And you're like, oh, my God, this whole thing was on purpose. And he was like, this was a, like I was truly felt involved and part of the whole experience. And that's what I, my point with this whole fashion thing is like I was always trying to be the inks inclusive brand. You know, I remember when I was 14, 15, I went to buy a t-shirt at Supreme and they said like, they would treated me completely like shit. When I was 14, I looked like I was eight. So I was like, I cannot believe these employees are fuck treating an eight year old who's trying to buy into the company. Yeah. So like I, I, I want you to take my money and you're I not like, paying attention to me. And you're not giving me anything. So I was like, fuck it fuck Supreme. I'm going to make the complete opposite of Supreme. You don't have to be a douchebag to be cool. You can be inclusive. You can support people, can help people. And that was really the ethos of the brand. It was like a anti-anti system, you know? Yeah. It's weird why that happens when 
a company is curating an experience like buying clothes or even sometimes coffee shops, uh, a lot of these companies are trying to incorporate an element of, of coolness that sometimes comes off like cockiness or coldness or just like they don't care. But in their minds, they probably think that it's like adding to the image of the store. Like we're so cool that, you know, our employees won't even come up to you and ask you, you want like you have to figure it out yourself. Or like sometimes I walk into a, a coffee shop and I, I ask a question like, well, oh, like I've never heard of that drink before. What's in that? And I'll be like, uh, I don't know, like, have you ever been in a coffee shop? And I'm just like, uh, I'm asking you a question. Like, why, why wouldn't you want to tell me more about your product or like make me feel like I'm part of this experience? Like, why wouldn't you want to include me in that? No, for me, it was a big turning moment. I was like, I was so pissed. <laughs> I mean, I was 14, but I was super upset about it. And I couldn't believe that that was the coolest thing. And then at the end of the day, I was like, man, fuck you. You're working retail. It's like my dick. <laughs> like, yeah. why are you, why are you being an asshole to me? But yeah, that was, so I kind of, I mean, I remember writing like, I am the ins- inclusive Supreme. I'm going to try to make a space that's going to help other people. And that's kind of what it ended up being. So. So one thing I wanted to get into before we wrapped up is the collaboration aspect of Kid Super and how different artists could be designers, could be musicians are, are coming into the Kid Super space and using it both as their home and, and making art. And I saw that Russ had been there at the start when he was putting out hundreds of songs, We're talking about Lil Luz Y is there. Another rapper, uh, Safa Ga. I was listening to his music. It's fucking dope. W- when did that aspect of it, it start? And like, how did you kind of get that going once you built the studio? It was always in the game plan for me. I always wanted to make that. And I haven't perfected it yet. It's just been kind of luck of the draw with the people that have ended up at the store, I think. So it's just like Russ was just kind of looking for a place to stay as one example. And Russ, he was like, yo, you have a studio. One of my friends, Doug, who's now Lolo's manager, funny enough, he was always into music, always scouring the internet. And he found Russ, who had probably like a total of 700 Instagram followers, but was making a ton of music. And he found one of the songs and thought he was amazing. It was like, hey man, if you ever want to come up to New York, I can introduce you to some people. And Doug was young, still in college. And he was like trying to dabble in if he wanted to be a manager, or how he wanted to get into involved in music. And so Russ came up and he was like, hey man, I want to introduce you to the Kid Super and the Kid Super uh, building and blah, blah, blah. And I had just finished the recording studio that I had built. And he was like, I, Doug was like, hey, you should probably, do you want to direct a music video? And I was like, yeah, I love the kids' music. I, I didn't even care about them. I liked the music, but I wasn't like, this is going to get millions of mm-hmm. views. I was like, I like music. I like people doing anything. So I say yes to anything. Anyone who's giving it their all, I'm I'm willing to support. So I directed these two music videos and me and Russ kind of just clicked. And I was like, hey, man, like, I got this studio that I just built. You should come check it out. And he got down there. He's like, man, this is amazing. The vibe's amazing, blah, blah, blah. And so fast forward five or six months, he was just still there living in the basement and making music. And he didn't have any expenses. He had a free uh, studio and we were just hanging out. And so we would talk about, I would be doing all the things that I'm doing while he's doing all the things he's doing. And it was cool. We bounced off creative energies. So that's how that happened. And then to this day, I mean, that's like one of my best friends and I do all his album arts. And I saw the claymation video too. That was fucking, that was dope. That was incredibly difficult. Um, Yeah. So I took, uh, or you said you felt like you were in a rush because you didn't have that much time. It was like the time stamp on it. And you so I it had up. been telling Russ I wanted to do a claymation video for Cherry Hill. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And it never happened. And so finally, eight months after Cherry Hill drops, he's like, let's do it. And Cherry Hill, he recorded in my basement. And I was oh, there shit. when he recorded it and I like helped with it and yeah. blah, blah, blah. So it was super important to me. 
And so I, I said, you cannot do this music video without me. I want to do it. And then I was like, I want to do a claymation video. But he finally was like, you can do it. But he had, he was gonna, about to drop a new album or a new song. And this was on the old album mm-hmm. in like two weeks. So he was like, you got to push it out. He was like, it must drop it in the next 11 days. Bah. And That's so, exactly how he said it too. Exactly. <laughs> so then I had to do it in 11 days and I, man, it almost killed me. But there was a moment I was so tired that like my body was shaking and I was like slapping myself to stay awake because it was some crazy thing. It had to be uploaded on Vivo in China the day before. <laughs> but we fucking pulled it off and it was... It's an amazing video and I just love the full circle of that song to me. It's, it was when we were in the recording studio, he was, I was telling him he should make a cold play type song. And so he used this gu- old guitar that's, it was in, that I got donated to the store that is basically mm-hmm. a toy guitar. He used that to play it and then he recorded it. And there was a moment where he was like, oh my God, I unlocked a new part of my voice. And that was on that song. And then I helped like restructure it and with some lyrics and stuff. So it's, it meant the world to me, that song. And so doing the music video also was a huge thing. Yeah. Whenever I hear on interviews, just as I'm doing research for this podcast, anything that's related to Kid Super, whether it's someone like Russ or, or I'm watching the behind the scenes of a, a fashion show, it always strikes me as such uh, like a family oriented vibe. Like Kid, like Kid Super is a family and, and it sounds corny as fuck, but like it, I think so much of uh, just like the front words view, the, the out facing view of fashion today, there's a lot of transactional stuff. Like, yo, if I pay you this, like, will you wear my shirt and an Instagram post? And like, that's the extent of the relationship. But whenever I hear someone that's talking about uh, Kid Super online, whether it's in a like YouTube or podcast or article, whatever, it always they're always like, oh yeah, like I fucking like live there. I was hanging out with these people or like, I know the people that are part of that brand. It wasn't a transactional thing to them. It was like a family vibe. Yeah, that's always been the whole thing. And I mean, my goal isn't for... My goal was never to have Kanye West wear my pants. My goal was to me and Kanye to be best friends. I hope he wears my pants. You know what I mean? But that's yeah. just the... I, as I Gotta say... plant the seed. As I say happened. before, it's just opening doors. Like we were trying to, we're doing this uh, YouTube series and we were thinking about um, all the people that had worn Kid Super. And we're like, well, that does make us almost best friends. <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's like, Sway Lee wore it. I think he's my yeah, best friend. <laughs> he's he's wearing something that I made that's, you know, it's a, so that's some sort of relationship, even yeah, if you guys haven't met. That's what I'm saying. So I always, but I want the brand to feel that way. If you wear it, you are a Kid Super. You're related to Kid Super. Yeah. It means more. It's not... Well, we're surrounded by SpaceX art. So we were talking about designing spacesuits before. So future yes. collaboration with SpaceX launch suits to, to Mars. That was... Put a, it on another planet. That was one of my pitches for my episode for my TV show. I said, uh, we'll design... Uh, Space suits with Elon. Dude, fuck it. He does so much shit. Have him uh, have him make a song in your studio. Say, we'll do a full collaboration because he, he just dropped another song, his second song on SoundCloud as a joke or whatever, but he's clearly interested in all aspects of design. And creativity. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I would love to interview him. That would be very cool. Put it out just into the out. universe. Hang out. Hang out session with Elon Musk. Yeah. Grimes is a big Lolo fan. Really? So we're getting closer. Fuck yeah. Another connection. And Grimes is about to have a the billion dollar baby. Oh yeah. So I think a uh, I think a good spot to end off. I was reading through the the Kid Super manifesto on the website. Wow. And uh a quote that stood out to me. This was written by you of course. You said, "I considered painting, movies, building, homework, all the same projects." I wasn't making art, nor did I consider myself an artist. And that really, that kind of stood out to me because just thinking of everything as 
the same. Like you're not getting in, you know, t-shirt mode or music mode, like homework projects, whatever it is, if it's visual, if it's more hands-on that considering everything, just another project to work on is something that gives you that kid super or, or Kanye element where you're just like, you don't really see a separation between different aspects because you're designing at the end of the day, you're creating whatever it is. So I like that manifesto. Nice. I'll try, I'll try to, I'll try to, that's, and I'll take in some of that, the manifest manifesto destiny to inspire my own. That's creations. amazing because when I wrote that, I mean, I was thinking, I mean, I didn't, I was trying to make some, I didn't, well, I was, what I'm trying to say is it's cool that you're affected by it because, you know, I was writing it, uh, hoping someone would read it and hoping someone would, you know, be inspired by it. So it's cool that you were, and I'm even, I like how it has all the original scribbles and like cross outs too. Like you literally took the time to write it out, which is part of why I started writing the the notes for a podcast because it just seems like more real rather than just having a laptop in front of my face. So I, I like how you had it actually written out. Yeah, I'm trying to think when I did that, you know, but no, um, that, that, like, that your effect to it and the fact that you read it inspires me as well. You know, I was, it's cool that you read it. It's cool that you thought about it, made you think. Yeah, of course. That's definitely part I'll of it. I'll send it to Elon. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe Elon will read. I want to read Elon's manifesto. That that would be crazy. He wants to end up on Mars someday. So, and Jeff just be- die on Mars. Like that. That's a wild. That it could be another three hour podcast. Like if you had the opportunity to die on Mars, would you do it? I talk to my friends all the time. There's like a, would you right now take get on the first spaceship to Mars. You 100% will die a legend, right? You're already, you're fucking Neil Armstrong of Mars, but there's zero chance you're coming back and you also don't know how long you're going to be able to survive there. Do you take that risk? Yeah. And then you have the the option because you know what Earth is whether you like your existence here or not, let's just say you, you're you enjoying Earth. You're like, fuck yeah, I love my life, love my family, friends, girlfriend, whatever. You know that's going to be there as long as you're alive, as long as they're alive. So do I take the chance of doing something cooler on Mars, knowing that I'll be a legend to the people on Earth, but then what if my life is over? You know, what if the spaceship explodes halfway to Mars or or I get out and we die? six months later or two days later. It's like you're taking a huge risk of what you know is great right now and what could be. No, I think it's like, what's more important to you, legacy or life? Because no matter what happens, you're a legend. You're, you're written in books. Not, not many things you do on earth right now will make you written in books. No offense to anybody. But what I'm saying is there's a lot of people that no one will write about. But if you take this spaceship, you're instantly in the history books. So it says, it's, it's like, what's important to you? Yeah, no, I literally wrote a script about it. <laughs> or like for, this, the, uh, for the TV series? No, you know, or for the, I'm just, always, I'm just, just to put always, it out there. Always writing things, always trying to, because <laughs> we might move this or like move to LA for a soccer field space, but... I was saying I can't move to LA if I don't have a fully done script. <laughs> Cause then what are you doing in LA? But it would be yeah, amazing exactly. to move it to LA with a fully done script and then be like here to whoever the fuck takes scripts. But and then it's like Yeah, that's kind of how I think in weird ways. It's more of these projects, these deadlines. I'm a huge person that's inspired by deadlines. It's sometimes good, but it's sometimes bad because if I I'm always holding things to the last minute. Like right now, I know I have a fashion show in Paris in June and I just haven't even thought or started it because June seems so far away, but every other brand's been started. So uh, I have to get to work on that. But yeah, I mean, these Paris shows are so much work, so much money. I still owe people money from the last one. 
Well, keep that <laughs> keep that script in the back pocket so you can sell it if you get to oh, if, you, yeah. if and when you get to LA. So, but yeah, th- thank you again for hopping on the podcast. I, I really do appreciate it, and it's been a pleasure. I can't wait to see what comes of the the new line that you're about to drop, and I'm excited to see the growth of Kid Super. So, thank you, Colin. Me too. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Augzoro. If you haven't already, please hit us with a five-star rating and comment on Apple Podcasts. This helps us appear higher in searches, which means more people will find out about Augzoro. Other ways to help get the word out is telling a friend, tagging us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, writing a blog post, or supporting us with a donation on Patreon. We are a completely independent platform, and we're grateful for every listener who supports this podcast. Thanks for coming along for the ride, and I'll see you guys next time.